And we are back, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for listening to me, Duke T. Back with you once again. Whew. And well, let's get into the. Uh, let's talk about She Hulk. And well, there are some interesting <laughs> uh, stuff about uh, you know She Hulk and. Yeah, um, <laughs> I, I got to say, the um, first off, well, first off, the trailer did not, but I'm like, wow, did the, I feel so bad um, for the V8 FX artist. I said this before, like, in the, another Duke CT Lounge, I, you know, I said many years ago, moons ago, uh, talk about this when they uh, did the Black Panther finale, which looked crap. Which is bad, and looking back on it, it looks really bad. After add all the other stuff they did and everything else, it just felt like they just were so overwhelmed of of that type of movie. It was so overwhelming of that, and the VFX seems to get worse and worse. And man, I I, I hate that because the reason why I hate that is because they're so overworked. And you know, so basically used to every movie, especially these high movies and such, these high um, you know movies and TV shows. You know, there is uh, you know so much. It's it's frustrating because you look at what's going on. Of like you know, you see She Hulk. It just I don't know. I mean, this is a character that needs to have that type of huge. Big bolsterous, um, just like okay, one of the lights, and this looks like honestly, it looks like just uh, a green Shrek. <laughs> and like I said, I feel so bad because there is no, like I said, uh, the the VHX, uh, there are no VF, uh, you know, and I think there's a reason why they said, I think the story here, so. Um, no, I don't. I I don't want to have it. I I don't care. Okay, let me see here. Um, let's see. Go on from here. Um, this is a very interesting article, and I'll see. And I'll see what's office. Why special effects seem so bad right now? This is someone who's from television, by the way, and. Um, it says right at X. Uh, how the process means, and it's frequently. They got on phone to me this uh, this article right here. Look here. Um, I'll leave the link in the description. And here it is. Um, it says that they are just, I mean, they're just like you know, married by compressed schedules, unfair labor practices, and cost cutting. And I was not surprised by this. And looking at the, just it, it, this is what it is. It says. I can't it's like right X. I can't swim on a movie side of things. But as I as uh coming from a TV perspective, my the, the short answer is there are more TV shows being made now than ever before. Many of them with more reliance on VFX than ever before. Nobody wants to give these things time or money they deserve because they don't want to spend a single cent they're not forced to. In your original piece, you asked how is it possible for a ten million dollar episode series, Marvel's Moon Knight, to have CV to CGI like this, which has been mediocre at best and just cheap at worst? <laughs> it says part of the reason is that budget numbers are deceptive. Ten million dollars an episode doesn't mean you're spending money and time, more time or money on VFX. It just means a larger percentage of the money getting funneled into above the line cost. Or the, the line costs above the line call of the line is basically everything except crew. Crew is below the line, and production expenses are below the line. Above the line is writing, directors, talent. Marvel is pulling in, in legit A list movie stars to do their six episode television miniseries. So, my question is, how much? Okay, question is, how okay, how much is Oscar Isaac getting paid? How much of that budget is talent sucking up in the early days of the Netflix? Uh, Marvel partners that their lead actors were movie stars. We're mostly getting twenty to thirty k an episode, with some ex- ex- exceptions. Then you look, start to look at what uh, all the movie stars coming started to come in. There are plenty of movie stars who uh, only want to do two hundred million dollar movies and make twenty million for doing it. But there are 
just as many actors who are like, man, I just want to work. I want to stretch myself. I want to do something interesting. So they come to TV where you don't get paid nearly as much. They might also know that they have to take a slightly lower salary for that project to make the rest of production work. Would that be fair to say? Oh, 100%. Provider X. But probably around 2018, you start to notice, wow, these actors are making 450 grand per episode. I think Drew Marimore was making $400,000 for Santa Clara Diet on Netflix. That was around $3,500. Then you start to see these above-the-line salaries creep up and up and up and up. If you're a showrunner, you're sitting there saying, oh, my God, we can get A-list actors for a 10-episode premium cable. So let's say someone is asking for $600,000 an episode. So your number one on the call sheet is only $6 million total for a show that might be budgeted at $80 million total. Which means one actor is sucking up 7.5% of your total budget. If you're an actor, it's hard to say no to that. Right. And look, and look, it's really hard. It's a hard job for actors. But they don't let showrunners pick where the money is going. You could push back on certain things, but you're not going to win every battle. You're ultimately beholden to the money people. And it's crazy that we expect every hour long TV show to be shot in eight or nine and a half days. In the older days, say an episode of Star Trek, uh, the next generation, ninety-nine to ninety-nine to one hundred percent, your show was shot on the soundstage. You can show lighting, temperature, noise. It was very friendly environment to make television in. You can pit your dates easily and wrap up on time or early every night. But for the average hour-long show today, it's way more exterior. It's way more stuff not on stage, and that eats into effects. I think people care a lot and want VFX to look good. But the overcapacity issue in terms of number of movies and TV shows currently being made and and the production requirements they demand, it means it's becoming an impossible burden to apply the same standards across the board. For instance, on the episode of the one show we worked on, every time we knew that it was going to be a VXF shot, we have a rep for the VX company say, uh, on set, the representatives say that's going to be bad for us from a lighting perspective. Or let's make sure we grab that insert shot, a quick, a quick close up shot of me. I know the insert into the edit. VFX companies aren't just coming in months after production has wrapped, they're actively involved in production in the attempt to make sure they're best set up for success once it's time for them to start work. And there are no mistakes because mistakes equal increased cost. But then you look at what about time? It says uh, time can provide issues. A post-production calendar is time to the last minute. Because you have all these steps. Uh, all these steps to go through before it's handled to over to VX. First comes the editor's assembly. Then the editor's cut. And uh, the assembly cut, the director's cut, then the executive post, the showman's cut. Then you gotta go through various studios and network notes and co- continue to return the cut as you're trying to make the picture look with your lock. No, picture lock means the cut of all principal principal photography is now finished, and every edited shot has been locked in. Any delay during any part of the production calendar has downstream effect on every other department and how much time you have to to. Do they work? Uh, do their work in the old world? Were you shooting 22 episodes a year? Production was entirely in Los Angeles. Showrunner would be going from the writers' room to the editing suite to the sound mix to a stage where they're shooting the next episode. You'll be doing all those things in one day. Now that's been distorted and the calendars have been pulled apart so insanely, it takes five years to make eight episodes of television. While all these stuff's going on, part of uh, part of the post process, the VFX, tech, VFX technicians are working their magic. But if anything goes wrong, they might lose time, and they generally need polish to refine their stuff. And things always go wrong. So let's just say you have a release date that you're trying to hit. The studio and network know that, but they keep giving you notes, and big things keep changing. You are getting all these departments from doing their job, and you're cushioning the count out. FX houses are very good at what they do. When they have the time and money to do it. But if and if, but if NBC wants to air something, if they want to advertise something during the Olympics, that's that. If Mom wants to release something movie, release a movie on July 4th, whatever ready is going to release on July 4th. So then on certain shows where you're put on good command stock and VFX, the effects scene can end up being left with a reduced amount of time to create those effects. 
and can't put in the care and meticulousness that they want to provide. Would that be correct? Yes, it comes down to time, money, time, and money. You can always crunch the entire crunch across the entire studio. I knew that word. I know that word. <laughs> oh, yes, crunch. Oh, good old fashioned Captain Crunch. Oh, crunch time, baby. Happens too. Happens at every level. Very few FX artists are you and I's. Um, I exactly the uh, you, IATSE, the union that represents many people who work behind the scenes in entertainment, was trying with limited success to unionize them. So that means the working conditions are terrible. Working 14th or 70 or 80 hour days for weeks or months on end with none of the benefits or protection the union will provide. Like saying, make sure the people are not doing unpaid overtime. A similar thing you hear about with animation studios closing. A lot of Canadian anime houses have closed in the past few years because they are crunching for their lives, and then the contract is over and their work dries up. I heard, I heard this one and another day about a major movie studio. Their VF company just quit because it was just going to be six months to a year of really hard, intense work. They were like, this, that's actually not good for us. And that's taking a handful of smaller, shorter time jobs. VS, VFX houses are perhaps getting smarter and saying, we're going to put more work into this than we're actually getting paid for. We're going to be trapped in this project no matter what you throw at us. Maybe it's more lucrative and possibly better for our artists if we could do one, if we could do six one month jobs instead of one six month job. And yeah, they're basically like crunching 18 hour days doing all this stuff. Given exactly, and the directors are given the circumstances. Our F, our FX houses tend to change more, charge more for the work for the understanding that they will, that they will get it done as fast as they can, and quality ends up taking a backseat as long as it's on schedule. Right, X. Nobody wants bad VFX in their projects. Many of us, who were, we, while we're sitting there writing TV pilots, our vision our series having significant VFX elements. But we don't know how easily or difficult or expensive these elements might be to implement or how much time it will ultimately take or how crunch will be when the work is actually happening. And the studios and networks don't either. Nobody's thinking about the numbers when they're writing a pilot. They're thinking about story. But later on, but then later on, when you start thinking about the cost and start asking questions like, how are we going to do this? Who's going to do it? How are we going to pay for, pay for it? What does the VFX house account look like? Look like in three and a half years when we actually post on this. In a way, it's unknowable, and so it, I think a lot of creative and production executives have said that's a problem that we handle down the road. We know it's a solvable problem because there's a ton of CGIers out there who are really good, but there's just so much, so, so much coming through the pipeline. So everyone loses except for the studio heads, I suppose. The people who run the VFX houses, same way that fucking runs the Blizzard. Makes a mint and treats his workers like shit. Absolutely. <laughs> yep. Uh, of course. Do you believe studios have convinced themselves that certain houses make good effects when really it's just grading them on their ability to turn the work around fast or less? I think you find that cost cutting comes in subtler and more dangerous ways. For example, look at the movie Rust, a non yoon production. You look at the DP who got shot to death on that set. They were having armor. They will have an armor double up as an assistant to the props person. That's a way to save money. It's also guaranteed to make sure some, that something fucks up happened on your set. These are places where I think corners get cut because production executives are just like, make it work. And they ignore the downstream effects of it. There's no excuses for poor on safe safety regardless of what is non unit or not. That whole thing was a fucking travesty. And I made a promise to myself because I of it. That will never have real guns on set or guns, uh, real guns on set or mine in the future. We'll do muzzle flashes with, you guessed it, CGI. With so, if you're actually looking for visual stuff, saying that hippo looks ridiculous or that title doesn't look real or that's laughably bad, I don't think it's any creative watching saying like, eh, it's okay. They might say we hate this. Is there anything we can do about it? And the small options, but the but if the answer is still no, they might still release it. Hmm. Is there any hope in unionization against FX works as are too desperate a business for it to happen? Right or X? I don't know. One issue is that the VS offices aren't just in the US. So even if the VS, every VH house was unionized, the students will go to Canada or the UK or they have to give them a lower quote for their work. But I'm totally without hope. A couple years ago, 
I was like, kind of like, video game folks would never be nice because it's too close to related to tech. It's a lot of people hoping to make a lot of ton of money, hoping to make a killing on thing, and the workers don't have any buy-in. But there's some progress there. Some tech-specific unions are making a dent in organizing workers. On the tip line, you gave us one example of a streaming service delaying something because the effects were ready yet. But in general, that's never the case. Would that be accurate? On a Established streaming service like Netflix Lay matters less. On the streaming service that are trying to make their bones, all of them are really dependent on these quarterly earning reports. How many subscribers that happen? The reason so many new shows are launching in March now, right? There's a reason there's so many new shows are launching in March now, right? They're trying to get in that under that quarter one deadline and goose another subscribers to have right before the earning calls. And Lay's become hard to stomach. I also think Marvel is its real own really weird beast. I'm not totally convinced that they know how to make television yet. It's a feature people taking a feature budget and then just dividing it to another episodes. They're not calling anybody a showrunner. Instead, calling them a head writer. That's on purpose. What Marvel shows do is they bring in a head writer, but you say, we're just going to pay you scale for X number of weeks, and we're not giving you a full writer's room. They're trying to get the most amount of stuff in the least amount of time, or the least amount of money. They're actually saying, how can we pay scale to make people work for very short periods of time? To do the same amount of work, what you always have to, had to do. I hate to say this because I think it's gonna that's gonna fuck up all my projects, but I wouldn't be surprised if there's a writer guild strike uh, 2023, and I hope for one. But I wouldn't be surprised. It's just gotten so hard up for people to piece together on, on, on the mini rooms and the rages are not coming up. Yes, it's cutting margins where they can find them, but no greater benefit for the product. Which, yeah. It's yeah, it says the studios are pretty in poverty. This is what they always do. They always say things that have been harder. They got a special cutout deal in the 2008 CBA to rent the wireless go from new media. New media is just media now. Netflix doesn't pay residuals. Believe me, if there's a strike in 2023, there's a good, there's a lot of great stories in it. And the town press has always turns against us in such insane degree during the negotiations because they're all owned by the studios. NYC owns the Hollywood Reporter. Deadline is just an industry building to board, and uh, but. Whatever the writers are like, you should pay us what we're worth. They're like, is that a Tesla we see in your garage? Whoo! Whoo, boy, that is. Oh, man, that's, that is fire. That is just. Wow. I mean, it's not really surprising, ladies and gentlemen. That's not surprising. I mean, that's why the, the, the effects and everything else. And, of course, sadly, and, you know, you still have, you know, I watched the trailer once, but then. You have stuff like this, and I think I'm, um, you know, I'm part of the problem too. I watched at least a couple times, but you know, the She Hulk Attorney Law trailer got 70 million views in 24 hours. So, you know, there's a market for it, and Disney Plus is right there. Even though there's like some drama with all the stuff and the dope case they build, everything else. Oh, they're losing subscribers. No, they're still on the top of the streaming market right now. And as long as this stuff still happens, you know, the people they're gonna force these things out. They're going to keep going faster and faster and faster and faster and faster. Just keep going faster and faster, you know, and and there's going to be less quality. Very, just very, very bad quality of uh, pictures and such, you know. It's going to be very bad quality. So be warned that this, ladies and gentlemen, let me just see here. This is going to be the future. This is going to be what we're going to expect in the BFX department if things don't change. If people will say, you know, we sit there and actually wait for quality. Because I would rather wait a year or two years or maybe three to say, hey, let's have some good quality here. Let's bring some BFX and pay them what they worth. Maybe we shouldn't be sitting there and overworking these poor fools for 18, 19 hours a day. How about we actually just say, you know what? Let's get bring it back and scale back the movies and the TV shows, superhero or high concept stuff for a while. You know, I won't mind that. I mean, yeah, I mean, let's not overwork people because this is what happens, ladies and gentlemen. You overwork people. You overwork. But hey, that's just me, Big CT. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for sticking with me all night and all that long and all that good stuff. 
Anyway, it's Dixie T here. Peace, love. I will see y'all when I see y'all later.